Hello my Soccer Universe and welcome to part 2 of my year review, the top 10 moments of 2023 and actually in this video we will have the top 4 moments plus some honorable mentions. So this is definitely the highlights of this year from my perspective. However, quick recap and if you want to see the full video, I link it above here of part 1. What are the stories that we've talked so far? We had at number 10, the fireworks in Austria, literal fireworks, fits very well with New Year. We had winners turning into losers, you know, some big clubs that are really, really struggling later on. We talked about the Dortmund choke job in the Bundesliga. We talked about the crazy summer that Milan had where everything got turned upside down. We talked about Serie A teams doing really well in Europe uh, this past spring and still doing really well in Europe. And we also, of course, talked about the Manchester City treble winning season. But yeah, that was in the past. Now let's move in to the next story that really moved me in 2020. The big international tournament this year was, of course, the Women's World Cup. And it was a really, really good tournament, despite the kick of times being really horrendous if you live in Europe and probably even worse if you live in the States. Uh, it was a tournament that I could follow very well and I actually enjoyed having morning games in a way. Uh, it was also a very open, very unexpected tournament. The dominance of the US gone. The United States almost got eliminated in the group stage by Portugal. Portugal. They got eliminated in one of the craziest shooters that you will ever see against Sweden. Sweden then in turn also eliminate the informed team in Japan, a Japan team that actually demolished Spain, the eventual uh, champions as well. England looked kind of, you know, shaky a little bit overall, but saucer enough to make it through, made it all the way to the final. Australia had also another crazy shooter against France, really ignited everything. They moved on at a time and I thought that France might actually be the team to beat. Another sensation was Germany went also out in the group stage. And I will never forget this brilliant goal that Linda Casado scored against the Germans. Absolute crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. In the end, the two best teams of the tournament, although still teary eyed for Japan because Japan played really, really well and I'm not sure how they lost to Sweden, but you know, Sweden muscle everyone in the women's game <laughs> and end up winning the third place they also beat the host australia in the third place match but in the end i think the two best teams made it to, to the final because spain kicked into another gear in Nagara, beating switzerland then beating the netherlands in the semis uh they oust uh sweden and then in the final they also win it but then that was only the beginning <music> So, before we go deeper into what happened in Spain over the summer, a few honorable mentions. These are topics that I was considering, but in the end just didn't make the cut. And I want to start out with the first one, which probably should have made the cut, but I just couldn't fit it in. I was really excited about what Feyenoord did this year, especially with former last captain Gernot Trauner being at the heart of the defense and also there to lift the trophy, kind of as the vice captain was a mega story. I was really excited about Feyenoord there. I also am quite excited, although none of these teams are accurate support, are three teams that have now in the start of the new season, 23-24, played really well. I want to mention uh, PSV completely destroying uh, the Eredivisie, having not only won games so far. Really, really impressive stuff. Totally the anti-Ajax. We also have um, Leverkusen, being top of the Bundesliga table of playing some scintillating stuff. I was never a Leverkusen fan, but this team, it's easy to uh, really cheer for. And the question is, can they really break the Bayern curse? The problem is that this is probably one of the better Bundesliga seasons because there are many teams that rack up a lot of points. Last season, this Leverkusen team would be already in the clear. So again, Bayern probably will push it, but Leverkusen, they showed already against Bayern that they can do it. Uh, another team, of course, and this is probably the biggest story, Girona. And yes, it's not a total fairy tale, but it is a combination of good work, a small town club with receiving 
serious uh, financial backing, but not to the extent that you get the mega transfer suddenly going in and Girona uh, challenging the big guys uh, on the transfer market. No, but Girona are challenging the big guys in Spain in the table, playing really great stuff at the moment. They are the team to watch in Spain, playing great stuff, many calm coming against many goals, and they are a really good team as they showed when they went to Barcelona, not the Camp Nou, the Moshuic, beating them 4-2. So these three teams also a mega story. Another major story is the bad standard of refereeing, especially in the Premier League. Uh, it hit really high water mark when this Liverpool goal at Spurs did not count because of uh, miscommunication. And while it's not exclusively an English problem uh, in the Premier League, it really hits another level, the ineptitude. That's a major story. And then the other storylines are all transfer related. And, you know, I do not like to talk about transfers too, uh, so, so much, but we had first the Saudi push of buying, trying to buy off all the big stars, especially of a Muslim faith. Uh, they got Cristiano Ronaldo, more on him a little bit later, already um, after the World Cup. And then, you know, Karim Benzema, N'Golo Kante, Sadio Mane, really, really, really big names. And they were, ah, will they be the next league? I never really th uh, said it, I thought about that. And we see already it's not really hitting because, you know, you have star players, but you still have to deal with the Saudi players. There's this huge gap in, qual in quality. So uh, it is a big push. The Saudis are pushing in at Newcastle as well. And now I hear a Milan takeover, which I really don't want to have to, to be honest. Uh, but let's see. But that is one a huge story. Uh, but we had other mega transfer stories. Ronaldo, we already said, left. Messi joined the MLS. And so the two most prominent players of the past decade and a half are now out of Europe. And for me, in retirement, although Messi goes quite a stir in Miami, but for me, Messi is retired, more or less. And then the uh, last one are the two big English transfers this year that really hit the mark. And English, talking about Harry Kane, a mega transfer for the German Bundesliga, going to Bayern Munich uh, and, extingu and annihilating every scoring record for now. And then, of course, Jude Bellingham, who I would say for the fall is the best player in the world. And scoring goals for Real Madrid, bailing out Real Madrid on many levels, despite having lost Karim Benzema and having many injuries. So those are other major, major story lines that just did not make it. And now to the top three. Okay, I alluded already before we had the honorable mentions that winning the World Cup for the Spanish women national teams only kicked off a much bigger story. But before we get there, I want to kind of appreciate what a great summer Spanish national teams actually had because the men and uh, uh, Luis de la Fuente kind of out of nowhere went into this Nations League under the radar won the whole darn thing. Yes, the Nations League is not a big tournament yet, I would like to see. And yes... Probably more sympathies were with Croatia to finally win a title than potentially Spain, at least from my side. But the way that Spain won, uh, you cannot really argue with it, especially since it was not even the first team squad, if you would like. So very good on Luis de la Fuente, who got prolonged taking over from Luis Enrique after the World Cup and the Spanish national team that looked completely abject at the World Cup and even lost to Scotland looks on a much better way at the moment and are among the favorites for the upcoming Euros. That was of course topped by the Spanish women, as I already said, kicking into second in the next gear in the knockout route and then in the end really deservedly, despite having this big loss to Japan in the group stage, deservedly winning the World Cup as the best team, you know, Pombati, Paralevelio and, and so on, they all kick into the next, 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 next gear. Uh, it did not also come out of nowhere. I mean, Spain has been touted as one of the most attractive teams for a while. We know Barcelona are dominating uh, in Europe, so it did not come out of nowhere. However, already in the build-up to the tournament, there were players from Barcelona that did not want to play for Spain because they didn't like the coach, Jorge Wilda, and it was kind of already weird to see Jorge Wilder was celebrating, but by himself, because the team did not really want to celebrate with him. And that 
was already a big story that some of the best players of Barcelona or of the Spanish national team actually didn't play for the national team to win the World Cup. So this team could have even better. However, the whole story exploded all over the world when during the trophy ceremony, FA president Luis Rubiales decided to kiss Jenny Hermoso in the most disgusting way possible. Let's put it that way. He claims it was consensual. Um, he tried to extinguish the fire. I mean, from what we hear now, uh, this became a story. But since it was Australia, uh, it didn't reach, uh, you know, a larger com com community. And Jenny Jen also, there was a video where she said she didn't really like it. Uh, that this happened, then it became a story, then that quickly on the way back they tried to extinguish it and say everything was consensual and it just blew over. It just blew over. And yeah, Spain really had to face up with the um, issue of sexism and all that kind of stuff happening within their FA and institutionally. However, I also want to say this is only accidental that it happened in Spain. Could have happened anywhere but this became one of the biggest stories this year and i want to recognize them for, for that in the end it happened what had happened what needed to happen is Rubio rubiales steps down or was stepped down let's put it that way uh well, also some unfortunate you know the men's national team was kind of not on the same wavelength either so that did not also sit well but mega story probably the biggest story internationally coming out of this year all thanks to a women's football tournament. Who would have thought? To be honest, in a way, the number two story that I have here in this countdown is a story of 22 because Napoli won the title based on their great form already displayed in late 22. However, they pushed through and got the third Serie A title to the city of Naples, the first one not with Maradona and Di Lorenzo said it just dawned on me I will be the only other captain for Napoli to ever lift the trophy and the other one is Diego Maradona after home the freaking stadium is named it was a never-ending party and I am a huge Milan fan you know that and for me the title uh, party in Milan was already really special when I saw the parade and, and so on there is no city in the top leagues in Europe that celebrates as much as Naples. You cannot tell me that there's an, no city it means so much. It is also a title that has been a long time in the making. Yes, Napoli are not a super top club in Europe. However, they will have, or have been now for a while a top club in Italy and probably should have won a title sooner. That it finally happened already was a relief but what made it even better that they made it in style and this team with Kim on the back who unfortunately left for Bayern, Quaraschelia and Oziman and Politano up front and then many other players Mario Rui uh, uh, in, in there you know it's so much it was so much fun to see Napoli play and win this title uh, it was a true feel-good story and this is coming as I said from a Milan fan I was excited for this Napoli team I said if Milan don't win the title Napoli the team that I would give would deserve it the most just for what they have done and doing it in style and then with Spalletti uh, finally also his crowning moment made it a real real good feel uh, a good feel feel good story uh, the way it happened, I mean, it was a little bit of stumble over the line. I mean, everyone knew already by February, uh, it's only Napoli is going to win the title. The question was not if, but when. It finally happened on a rainy night in Udine. Uh, it was just crazy scenes there. And I think they had then three home games where after every home game, they had a little title celebration there. And the trophy was only lifted. You know, first, yeah, we celebrate everyone come on the stage. We are champions. Then we had another one. Yeah, let's all the staff, let's uh, celebrate them. And then on the last home game of the season, they were allowed to lift the Serie A trophy. Naples went mad. And I think this must I think the, Mar the first Maradona championship will always feel special because the first is always the best. But this long wait and then having a chance to celebrate for so long must have felt really, 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 really good. 
Unfortunately, it all fell apart relatively quickly as well. And this is probably, probably the, uh, the saddest story that um, because of internal workings, you lose your sporting director to Juve. You use lose Balletti because De Laurentiis didn't treat him well. You lose Kim. You keep many other players, but you hire the wrong coach. Now again, it looks kind of so and so. And these title defenses are already fizzling out a little bit, although there are still some very, very good players on the team that are spectacular on the day to watch. So yeah, I hope this wasn't the last one in a long time. Uh, yes, I would like to win Milan every other title. But if Napoli slash Roma wants to get uh, rid of Mourinho, win it, I think I would be. Ha I also would feel that this would be a good season for Serie A. Fortunately, all points to Inter at the moment. Okay, it should come as no surprise to anyone who watches this channel that the biggest moment this year for me, no, it's not a title celebration, but it's the fact that Lusk have a new stadium and that also meant my return to watching Lusk in the stadium regularly. It just aligned perfectly. It just aligned perfectly. The stadium is we don't need to talk about it it's the best stadium in austria at least club it's the best stadium in austria uh it is great looking yes i have some criticisms on it but it is exactly what is needed a modern stadium for this team to hit the next level but what made it special to me is that i really want to go to go to this first game and the only way to reasonably go there was buying a family half season ticket which we did and this is now the true highlight. My wife and my girls really enjoyed doing that and going. Yes, it really helped that the opening game, which was horrendous, awful weather. The game was so nervous. You win it on a completely gifted non-penalty in the 94th minute. However, that boosted us quite some. The next game you lose at home to Salzburg was sellout crowd but it was not not so bad but then actually in the playoffs last kicked in the next gear and there were some really fun games and most of the goals were scored on our side i remember beating rapid 3-1 which was a definite highlight beating sturm in a comeback win uh that just had beaten us in the cup final which was a cup semi-final which was probably the best game of uh the year in austria i would claim uh or at least first half of, of, of the year. Uh, uh, goals against Klagenfurt, many against Austria Vienna. It was really fun to watch Lask in addition. And they build up this. You qualify for Europe. You have the opening game of the 50th season of the Aust Aust Austrian Bundesliga in the stadium. Again, another one. Like the first uh, game of in, in the stadium was not a good game of Lask. But again, you score in the 94th minute, this time not to win it, but to draw against Rapid, which always feels good, a game that they should never have won. You had then the much anticipated, and this, the buzz in the city. You had a derby again that you won at that stadium in the first sellout, although you saw some patches there, but you know, I can see why they would, uh, say it's a sellout. They sold every ticket there. That was already, and this was probably the best TIFO. But then to top it all off, you qualify for Europe and you have the sweetest draw, at least from an economic point of view, you play Liverpool. And it's the first game and in the first half, you even take the lead that only the last half hour you cannot hold on to. That was fever pitch. That was the high point of the season right there. Being able in the new stadium to host Liverpool, yes, the Europa League did not go well. Overall, it was rather unlucky. You threw it away away from home. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I think Lusk could have finished easily third in this group. Um, but, you know, luck didn't fall the way and they didn't uh, convert their chances. However, in the league, there were also other fun things. Um, you got on a real run, beating Salzburg away from home, which they haven't done in quite a while. Uh, then you beat Sturm Graz at home again. You also beat Austria Vienna, which always feel, feels good. But, and this is also another high point now for me. At this Sturm Graz game, I had a buddy from England, fellow YouTuber Matt, visiting me, and we enjoyed that game together, which was actually a really good game to boot. 
So yeah, overall I feel really good and then to top it all off, I also was invited to, to have the Christmas party of my work at that stadium, which to me it's just the cap, the cherry on top. So for me, definitely the moment of the year is the new stadium, some great games in there, we had a lot of fun, the kids are having fun in there, which makes me as a father really, really happy, my wife enjoys it, it was even to the point where I was saying, uh, do you guys want to go uh, again, and my wife, of course, of course, we need, need to get, and then she even said, yeah, we need to get the tickets for Liverpool too, it was me and my wife, then only, and my brother, but uh, that shows me, yeah, this really hit home, home as well, so definitely, absolutely, 100%, my moment of the year. So there you have it. 10 moments and a few more that moved me in 2023. Let, let me know what are stories that you moved you and that you would like to probably have seen in this video as well. Although I said it's a personal video for me. So really, what were your highlights of this year? Really would be interested in that too. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to wish you a very happy new year in 2024. I probably am gonna take a small break from making video videos, but you know, you never can keep me away from a, a camera for too long, let's say, but I also wanna take a little break and enjoy the New Year's festivities and then we'll come back in the new year, hopefully better than ever. In any case, I will talk to you soon and happy new year, bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you may enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hitting the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye!